2016 has been a tough year for pollsters. Voters in Colombia have narrowly rejected a landmark peace agreement and a referendum which had been expected to support the deal. Sanders will in fact beat Hillary Clinton in Michigan's Democratic presidential primary. Consider that in all 15 pre-election polls, Clinton led Sanders by double digits. People of Britain have spoken, voting for a British exit dubbed Brexit. It has to be said, this is also a catastrophe for the opinion pollsters who've uh, mucked up again. If recent events have taught us anything, it's that you shouldn't trust the polls. Whatever your country, party or candidate may be, let me repeat, do not trust the polls. Here's the problem. Polls are usually quite good. Over the years, they've become more accurate, more sophisticated and more numerous. In fact, during the 2012 presidential election, the website 538 was able to predict the winner of all 50 states by aggregating polling data. Now that might sound reassuring, but this year, the polling industry is in crisis, facing the complete collapse of their traditional methods and an election which is unlike anything that they've ever seen. To understand what's happening, it helps to look at how polls actually work. To put it very simply, an election poll is made by asking a group of people who they plan to vote for. The results are usually adjusted to make them more representative of the actual voting population, a process known as waiting. But today, pollsters are facing an existential crisis. People have just stopped talking to them. Landline telephones and robocallers made polling cheap, easy and accurate for almost half a century, until the rise of the cell phone. Although response rates have been declining for years, the biggest problem is that millennials just don't own landlines. With internet polling still in its infancy, this leaves a huge chunk of the electorate out of reach for traditional polls. These trends have made polling less representative, so pollsters have to paper over the cracks by relying more heavily on waiting. But that's left them very vulnerable. Waiting polls is a tricky business, which requires good demographic and historical data to model how voters will behave. Now, perhaps you can already see the problem, because how on earth do you model an election like this? 2016 is a very weird year, and here are just a few of the reasons. Since 1950, the US has only had two elections without an incumbent president or vice president. Now, I know I've been saying not to trust polls, but they have come up with a few figures which, if they're accurate, show just how unique this election is. Both candidates are historically unlikable, hovering around 55 and 65% unfavorability ratings. Or to put it another way, 81% of Americans say that they would feel afraid following the election of one of the two candidates. That's probably why third parties have gained significant support, making up 10 to 15% of the electorate. Any poll which predicts voter behavior based on a generic Republican versus generic Democrat model is in trouble, because whatever else you want to say about them, neither Clinton nor Trump are generic. Given their unprecedented unpopularity, it's also entirely possible that people are lying about who they support, or won't even turn up to vote. These factors combine to make this election into a pollster's worst nightmare. Serious pollsters deal in probabilities and margins of error. But the way polls are reported rarely goes further than two simple numbers. Very few of us can view these with cold rationality, or an impartial understanding of odds. Polls have become like an emotional crutch, which people use to reassure themselves. Because whichever candidate you support, fear of the future and the unknown are universal. The day before the Brexit referendum, almost every major poll showed a result in favour of staying. When they were proved wrong, many argued that the polls made people complacent, contributing to low turnout by pro-EU voters. Polls undeniably affect voter behaviour. There's evidence that people use them to bandwagon with perceived winning candidates, gauge whether they can vote tactically, and even decide if they should bother turning up to vote at all. And the media's obsession with them is about a lot more than just filling airtime. Good numbers can lead to more coverage, name recognition, and donations for a candidate, even deciding where they stand in primary debates, as Donald Trump has eloquently explained. President of the United States by insulting your way to the Let's see, I'm at 42 and you're at three. So, so far I'm doing better. Doesn't matter. So far I'm doing better. You know, you started off over here, Jeff. You're moving over further and further. Pretty soon you're going to be off the end. This doesn't do a thing. Right now, the polls aren't looking as good for Trump, although he tends to disagree. We will win. We will shock the world. This is going to be Brexit plus. The point is that no one truly knows, especially in this election. Polls matter, but not for the reasons that you might think. They affect how we think about elections and, as a result, how voters behave. And if they can affect the nature of voting, they can affect the very nature of democracy. Which is why we need to view them with a healthy dose of scepticism. But it's not that polls are bad. When done correctly, they can be informative. But the thing is, they do more than just inform. 
that they influence. So don't let the polls dictate your behaviour on election day. And definitely don't let them keep you from voting. After all, the only one who knows how you're really going to vote is you.